Before we kick off the show, if you're a fan of History Hack, please do what you can to support the show. We completely get that not everyone is able or willing to dig into their pockets. Times are hard, but by dropping a like, subscribing on Twitter and YouTube, and importantly, leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts, you can help the programme grow and reach more people. If you're interested in becoming a supporter, go to patreon.com forward slash history hack, where you'll find perks from secret Facebook groups to early release material. If you just want to leave us a one-off tip, go to co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description. And whatever form your kind support takes, know that we are massively grateful. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack, an instalment that's going to make Zach very, very happy. Why? Because we're back in my wheelhouse. We might even squeeze in a crime and punishment question later. Um, Sorry, not sorry. Um, (laughs) But yeah, we are doing some nice Napoleonic, and specifically British army in the Napoleonic era history. We are joined by Nick Fogg who's a fellow of Queen's University, Ontario, is a former advisor to the Middle East Institute at Harvard University, which sounds like a very important job. Um, And he's the author of Hidden Shakespeare, a biography, The Voyages of the Great Britain, and A Town at War. But today, we're going to be looking at Wellington's American General, the story of the longest serving officer in the British Army. I'm going to love this. Nick, welcome to History Hack. How are you doing? Pleasure to be with you. Oh, look at your little face, Zach. You're so excited. Should we just dive right in? Let's do it. We are talking about Frederick Robinson. He led an eventful life. He's the centre of the book. So let's start with his early years. What kind of a family did he come from? And what was his early life like? Right. um, Well, I suppose if there was an American version of de Bretz, um, he might well have been in it. Um, on his paternal side, he came from a Virginian aristocracy family, um, which was from an old Yorkshire family origins, um, who owned uh, Copt Hewick Manor near Cleesby in Yorkshire. Um, his great grandfather was the first settler on his father's side in, in the New World, um, who bought 300 acres of land uh, bordering Chesapeake Bay in 1666, the year of the great. Fire of London, um, and he became a member of the House of Burgesses. That was the colonial legislature of Virginia. In fact, it was the oldest legislature in the New World. And he also became um, the colonist secretary of state, um, appointed by William III. And he also um, was a founder of the William and Mary College, the second oldest uh, university in America. Um, So he established them pretty well. Um, the, the, uh, his son, another Christopher, built Hewick, which was the plantation mansion um, down there in Virginia. His son, his eldest son, John Robinson, was probably the most influential Virginian of the colonial era. He became Speaker of the House of Burgesses. He became Governor of Virginia. And he also became the colony's treasurer. And this is the naughty bit, if you like, because when he died, it was discovered that uh, there was a hundred thousand pounds missing. Imagine the, what that was worth in uh, the 18th century. Um, and these were all old used banknotes that he was supposed to have destroyed or under his regime destroyed. And in fact, he had failed to do so, and indeed lent all these banknotes out to his mates as as a sort of as loans. And so um, they, they had this great problem of this huge hundred thousand pound deficit. But uh, he wasn't in the direct line of uh, Frederick Robinson. Um, He was the eighth child of John, who was the son of a second marriage of of Christopher. It's all all getting complicated, so I'll I'll simplify it. Um, He became a captain of the militia against the French. There was a war in 1845 and went up to New York. Of course, eighth son wouldn't get much of the estate. So he actually went into business in New York City um, with Olive Delancey, another one of the famous... um, original families. In fact, there's even a street name, Delance's, in New York. If you know We'll Take Manhattan, it's mentioned in that. Um, and uh, he married Susanna Philipser, which uh, from a very old Dutch family, um, even older in the New World than the Robinsons, and they had built up vast estates on the River Hudson, 
Um, the first uh, ancestor, again, she was the great granddaughter, uh, great grandchild of her earliest settler, Frederick Phillipsy. Um, and he, um, as I say, built these vast estates up along the Hudson, but he was also very strongly involved, and this is pretty unwoke, in the triangular trade, um, which, of course, was shipping slaves from Africa to the West Indies and then sugar back up to New York, um, et cetera. Um, and also, of course, the Robinsons were slave owners. They had over 100 slaves on their plantations in Virginia. Um, you mentioned uh, in the question of Frederick Robinson's early life. He remembered as a complete idyll uh, growing up there on these estates on the Hudson. Um, he described it as the most perfect domestic happiness, and so I've never witnessed um, since. Um, he was just 13 years old when the... Um, Revolutionary War broke out, and so uh, that swept away to a certain extent um, this wonderfully comfortable um, patriarchal life that he'd experienced before. Well, that leads very nicely onto where I wanted to go next with this, which is that at the age of 14, he's fighting, isn't he? So he's in the American War of Independence. What do we know about his time in that conflict, and how did he feel about having to fight against fellow cousins in the form of you know the what the time were the rebels the oh have you want to refer to the independence movement within the 13 colonies well the american revolutionary war has been described i think probably quite accurately as america's first civil war and that in a way is exactly what it was um the uh, loyalists were actually a very powerful force within american society um uh, his father, Beverly Robinson, was probably the leading new, um, loyalist in the New York province, and he formed the Loyal American Regiment, um, uh, paid for it himself. Um, I think the issue of lo- loyalism as against um, the revolutionary gr- grouping was a, it's a bit like a train journey. You, you go a certain um, distance, some went all the way, some didn't go at all, and some sort of got off at, at certain points. Um, I think uh, the the loyalist um, regiments, there were quite a few of them, um, were recruited from old loyalist families. And you might wonder what their motivation was. I do, too. Um, Partly, I think it was because they'd already um, sworn oaths of allegiance to the crown and therefore they. They, um, they, they felt duty bound to honour these particular oaths they'd sworn. But that there were kind of dynasties. Um, he, Robinson himself didn't seem to think much of the uh, Republican Amer- Americans. Um, he he, uh, he describes them as a sort of uh, very um, un- unclassy sort of rabble, in essence. You know, um, although they did actually win win the war, so he's a bit wrong about that. Of his own war, there's a great de- that we there's a great de- amount of detail. He fought his first campaign as commander of a troop of grenadiers at the age of fourteen. Where he says, "I was only a mere boy." Um, th- this was the um, th- this was a battle. It was actually more a skirmish in in Connecticut in the early day, day, early early days of the war. Later, he was captured with his brother at Stony Point, which was an um, important. Um, fortress on the Hudson and controlled quite a lot of the uh, um, navigation along the Hudson. So it was, it was a pretty unfortunate loss uh, for the British and their American allies. Um, he was captured and um, went into captivity. The, the American soldiers wanted, wanted to kill him. The, 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 um, the uh, v- v- uh, vituperation had got, got so big then um, uh, but their officers prevailed and the, the two boys were spared and they, they were given parole in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania. And eventually they were part of a prisoner exchange. He participated in uh, the sacking of New London, which was a very unfortunate British atrocity, um, to what, two years before the end of the Revolutionary War and um, was really part of an expeditionary force to relieve um Cornwallis at Yorktown, which arrived a day too late to do that. So at the end of the war, the um, Br- British uh, armies found themselves in a kind of um, parole situation, waiting to leave America. They, were, they were, weren't they were harmed in any way, but um, obviously the agreement was not only that they leave America, but many, many loyalists were forced to leave America, including the Robinson family. 
ultimately, the Robinson family were on the losing side of the conflict. So how did they adjust to having to leave the fledgling USA and start all over again? Well, they were pretty unhappy, Alex, you may imagine, because uh, yeah. <laughs> if you if you had vast estates on the Hudson, um, Beverly Robinson reckoned his, his, he put in a claim to the British, the Americans agreed to um, repay or, or compensate uh, loyalists who are leaving for, for their losses. But uh, this was entirely theoretical in the tre- uh, treaty. When it came to the crunch, uh, very little money was made available. So the British government had to step in and uh, pay for all these uh, loyalists who had lost their properties and livelihoods and whatever else as a result of their support for the Crown in the American Revolutionary War. Um, quite a lot of um, Frederick Robinson's relatives went up to Canada um, and indeed were very participatory in the formation, of, ultimately, of Canada. Um, what his, one of his cousins, John Robinson, became Attorney General um, up in New Brunswick um, and actually fought in the War of 1812 in the early stages of that. So they were, they were still intensely loyal to the Crown. Frederick himself and his immediate family, his mother and father, they came back to Britain because he was still in the army. He was still an officer in, in the army. And eventually his father received around about £23,000 worth of compensation for his losses. Um, it took quite a while for to, to do that. The British government eventually paid out about three and a half million pounds, which was a colossal sum at today's um, level, um, to the American loyalists who'd le- who had left. Uh, they went all over the place. And they're really a kind of forgotten tribe, if, if you'd like to put it like that. Some went to the West Indies, some to Canada, um, and and some... Um, to back back to Britain and Ireland. So, the, the, but uh, one or two of them were quite eminent. Um, the man who um, started the um, English Garden in Munich, for example, um, who founded the world's first, first social security system. He was an American loyalist. And um, Benjamin West, the artist, you know, you'll see his work in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, he was another American lawyer, so they 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 actually fitted quite well. They were they regarded themselves as British, so they fitted e- quite easily into British society. What was Frederick like as an individual? Did he show promise as an officer? Do we have much indication of what his fellow officers thought of him? Um, th- they thought he was a bit straight laced. I think uh, th- this was a kind of age when. Um, Quite a few of these officers were into, into jigs and tails of body, to quote uh, Shakespeare. Um, but uh, he obviously was um, a quite admired officer in as much... You, I mean, if you just see what he achieved uh, within the army um, through his later life, um, he, he obviously was regarded as a, a young officer of great promise. He sent out to the West Indies uh ish swiftly afterwards isn't he i mean that's often referred to as the fever islands during this period because of the way that diseases just killed off so many europeans who traveled out there what was his time like and what did he actually end up doing whilst he was there it it, it was pretty awful um fun enough um i had a an off uh former um Colonel in one of the British regiments be in touch with me the other day about the book saying he hadn't realised how awful the colonial service was if you were in the army in those days. Um, one of the problems was that um, the this expedition was assembled at Portsmouth with the fleet and everything like this. And the idea was to um, actually strangle France by cutting her off from her uh, very valuable colonial possessions in the West Indies. Um, unfortunately, the, for the ex- expedition, it was delayed quite considerably. Firstly, because the French invaded the Low Countries, and they got uh, so part of the expedition got diverted to Ostend um, to try and uh, prevent the French take over the la- uh, Low Countries. Um, part of it got d- diverted to Toulon, where there had been a um, a royalist uh, re- rebellion against uh, the government, which was eventually, of course, um, Napoleon's first um, triumphs as a, as a general when he when he suppressed that rebellion. So the whole thing was delayed uh, by several weeks, which was unfortunate for the expedition because it meant they arrived in the West Indies at the time of the summer when the um, when the possibilities of infection were at their greatest. I'll just read a small um, section of, um, of, of the book, uh, which probably tells you something about the uh, 
conditions as they existed, um, the, 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 uh, they, they attacked various French islands successfully. Um, then to Robinson's chagrin, they gave most of them back in the, the peace treaty, Guadeloupe and Martinique. Um, but one that the British retained was St. Lucia, which he says is reckoned to be one of the most unhealthy islands in the West Indies in consequence of the large number of swamps or morasses in every part of it. It was the fate of our battalion to be posted within five yards of one of the worst of them, two days and two nights without being permitted to make bowers to shelter us from the heat of the day and the heavy dew at night, as we were within reach of the guns of Mourn Fortune and his, her, his Royal Highness Prince Edward, that's the commander, commander of the Brigade of Grenadiers, was appreh apprehensive of drawing the fire of the fort upon us. All the water we used issued from the swamp, and though very pleasant to the taste and sight, was downright poison to us. We had 45 men taken ill in one day, and on our return to Fort Royal Bay, we had two officers and 70 men ill with fevers and fluxes, either of which carried them off in two days. I was attacked with the same symptoms, but got the better of it for the time being by having a little Madeira in my canteen. So he saw it off with a... Uh, with a couple of bevies, I think, yes. Can't blame him at all. Um, so the army at this point is not a meritocracy, is it? Uh, how much of his advancement during the early part of his career is down to buying his way up the promotional ladder um, by purchasing commissions, patronage, links with those who had the ear of yeah. the commander-in-chief in horse guards, like Simerson in Sharp? Uh, and how much would you say was actually war ability? Uh, he never bought a commission in his entire career. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's, it's interesting that um, partly because he, when, he, when, he, um, when he arrived back in England, he was uh, sent on um, recruiting eventually to Bath, which he absolutely loved. It was a lovely place to be. Um, and of course, it was full of, uh, it was a high society and everything like this. And uh, fellow officers um, gambling and drinking and all the things fellow officers would be doing. Um, and he said, I was in this magical world, but I hadn't got a sou to spend because at this point, his father, he only had his pay. Um, most of his um, rise was due to his talents. Um, he had no money to spend. He was in Bath in that glorious atmosphere of a high social place, but had no money. He said, I hadn't got a sou other than my wages. Um, so when the West Indies expedition came along, of course, um, active service was was a good way to promotion because obviously people died either of uh, either of uh, in battle or even more of uh, of fevers and everything. Um, so ba ba basically, he rose uh, in rank. He'd already risen to the rank of lieutenant during the American War, though very young, and um, he he rose um, through in the West Indies campaign. He was taken very ill at the end of the West Indies campaign and he actually um, went to Ireland. He'd married an, a lady from Ireland and went, she'd gone back to Ireland while he was in the West Indies and he went back. And his immediate commander, Colonel Craddock, um, was also Irish, from Ireland. He was the son of the Archbishop of Dublin and he was in the process of forming a regiment, the 127th of foot, which was mainly recruited out of Irish jails, etc., as you might expect, and um, he uh, he appointed um, Robinson again without without um, uh, the uh, use of patronage um, to uh, the uh, officer uh, the position of major in the regiment. So he again achieved that through merit. The the next bit of the question, Alex, about your um, influence, knowing people of influence, was very important because obviously that's what you did. If you had, if you couldn't afford to. Um, by your by your commissions and everything, you, the best way forward was, if not war, was through cultivating um, influential officers. And he seems to have been very successful at doing this. Not just Craddock, um, but he his former commander was the Honourable Henry Fox, who who um, com commanded the thirty eighth of foot, which he'd ended up in. That's the Shropshire um, Staffordshire Regiment, rather. It ended up in the 38th of foot during the um, American War, and this was his commander. And this is the uh, brother of Ch the famous radical politician Charles James Fox. Um, he's hugely influential, and it's 
Fox, who recommends him um, to be in char- charge of recruitment for Bedford. So he gets this job of being in charge of army recruitment for Bedford. Eventually, because he does such a good job in Bedford, he's appointed in charge of army recruitment in London. He's also um, very strongly associate with, associated with William Merry, who's the second assistant secretary of war. So all, <coughs> he builds up this sphere of influence very successfully, I think. This, this actually... Um, produces him uh, his rise in the ranks i've got down here the um, but about his record in the peninsula it was it was absolutely brilliant um he he served in a number of battles he was a key uh, figure in the um wellington's um pivotal victory at v- uh, victoria um he he leads the rush into the breach of san sebastian which incidentally was another huge british atrocity the siege of san sebastian he's the first englishman the uh, first British soldier, apparently, to cross the Bidassoa back into France. He's the first armed combatant to actually enter France in the Napoleonic era. Um, and then, of course, he goes on to um, the Nive and Nivelle and Bayonne, where he also serves with distinction. So he's got all that record behind him. He has a view on flogging, doesn't he? And this is a self indulgent <laughs> question. Um, Alex is just dying of laughter in the corner. You just um, couldn't let it pass, could you? No. Go on, no, go I for it. I don't care how you know, <laughs> the listeners are falling off of their chairs in boredom um, yeah. because I love a chance to no doubt about discipline. Um, what was his stance on it? Because <laughs> well, um, one of the things about him was, and this is one of the appealing, quite a lot of what I've probably said isn't all that appealing there, is coming from slave owning stock and slave trading stock. Um, his uh, the use of patronage uh, uh, in terms of promotion and all this thing. Um, something that is more appealing about him is his opposition to flogging in the army. Um, and it's also appealing about him that, in fact, he um, seems to be rarely amongst uh, officers of his time, deeply concerned for the welfare of the ordinary soldier. Um, <coughs> when he's in the West Indies, he... he um, complains about the lack of nurses. They were called mates, um, somewhat confusingly. And he, he said there should be two to every uh, every unit, uh, nurses. Um, and he also um, talks about the soldier's diet being deficient. And um, within his own purlieus, he, he introduces rice um, as, as, as a means of, uh, of um, a more nutritious diet. Um, he also, uh, in the Peninsula, um, he is aware of the fact that in the Peninsula War, the rate of sickness uh, amongst the common soldiers exceeded that, even in the West Indies campaign. And so he does remark, he does comparisons that are quite remarkable at the time. He compares um, the death rate or the infection rate of fever and fluxes amongst officers and against the general population through which the army is moving with the that of the common soldier and of course it's the common soldier who is actually um the one who's suffering most from 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 disease and deprivation in that way he introduces the buying of local supplies rather than the terrible biscuit full of horrible um, crawling things that have been the staple diet. So he buys local bread, he gets local wine, um, et cetera, being in Spain, quite a good choice to do. Um, and um, he actually also isolates sufferers. He, he realises that typhoid is um, spread by, by lice, and so I, and he de the sufferers from ty- typhoid. So that's part of a, a wider picture. On flogging, um, when he's in Bedford as a recruitment officer, he, he becomes a great friend of the um, local member of parliament, whose name is Samuel Whitbread. You, you may um, associate him a little bit more with brewing an excellent product. Uh, but uh, in fact, he was also a radical politician, um, he was a member of a group in Parliament called the Mountain, which was modelled on the French uh, Revolutionary Assembly, and he included people like Wilberforce. And Whitbread was a very fervent um, opponent of flogging in the army. You know all about that, uh, Zach. Um, and uh, he um, enlists uh, Robinson in a way as an expert witness on this. You know that Robinson says that flogging is actually de- demoralises the. Um, the, the, the troops it doesn't actually install discipline at all and um 
Robinson, within the units he commands, actually abolishes no soldier is ever flogged in one of Robinson's regiments. Uh, and he's quoted by Whitbread and Wilberforce, etc., in Parliament, um, but of course anonymously. He wouldn't have his name being mentioned in, in Parliament as an opponent of flogging, because obviously the Duke of York, who's the commander of the British Army, is a fervent exponent of flogging, so he also has to protect his back. But he is quoted quite um, extensively during the debates, which unfortunately the anti-flogging brigade actually managed to get deluged by the pro-floggers in the House of Commons. Yeah, it's it's a long story, the journey towards flogging. Uh, being I think it's in, but, not until the 1870s that it's finally abolished. Yeah, And then it persists in military prisons beyond that into the 1910s. Yeah. It's a mm. very, very long story. Yeah. Um, the other person, of course, who's a, a big uh, proponent of flogging, I mean, I, we could have a discussion about York because I, I'm a bit unsure about York. Um, he does some things that seem to reduce it. And then... Uh, there are, and there's what you've just said. Um, but Wellington, Wellington, boy, does Wellington love to yeah, flog. Yeah. Absolutely, um, yes. And he sent out yes. to serve under Wellington in 1813. So how did that opportunity come about? What was his record like out there? And, and how did he get on with Wellington? Because on the one hand, Wellington is somebody who does care about supplies. That's one of the things that leads to the British Army's success in Spain and Portugal. Yes. On the other hand, you've got this flogging debate. So there are... There, yes, there are exactly. Um, well, um, what, uh, getting back to the previous topic, Robinson does raise the issue of the general health and well-being of the common soldier with Wellington. Um, and Wellington actually does acknowledge that uh, the, there, is a, there is an issue, but he, he says that it's from recruits being so young and they, they get drunk all the time on very bad wine, which which may not have helped, but I don't think it was the actual cause. Um, uh, Wellington, in that point, uh, you probably know more about it than I do, Zach, but I think he he has this sort of um, split personality with regard to the common soldier. On one level, as you said, he is quite caring of them, but on another, they're quite expendable, etc. Anyway, so how does he get on with Wellington? Well, um, because of the, he's only on half pay because he's he's not on active service. Um, he's got a growing family and he's got debts um, that Duke of York knows about and actually um, denounces him for his debts, which was a bit sort of hypocritical. So he had vast debts himself. But um, so he, he one of the, he's got these two people of influence that he knows. One's Lord Hobart, um, who is the Minister of War, and his assistant William Merry. Um, and Colonel McMahon, who's the secretary to the Duke of York, um, he's another influential. So he knows these influential chaps, partly bit through being in charge of recruitment for London. So he applies to um, to go to the peninsula because he'll be on full pay there. I mean, the irony is that the peninsula army wasn't being paid anyway. That was one of Wellington's complaints. Um, but he does get this position and that Wellington's requested um, more senior officers. So he gets sent out. He arrives at a porter and then has to travel to Burgos, where Wellington is in deep trouble um, in the siege of Burgos. He's in real trouble. Um, and indeed, uh, he's looking defeat in the, in the face. Um, well, uh, Robinson arrives at probably a most untimely moment because Wellington's about to retreat from Burgos. And then this fellow pops up and... Uh, Wellington says, well, this bloke's no use to me. He has about three or four of them, two of them Germans from the King's German Legion. He says, I don't want any of these people. You know, why do you keep sending me this debris? I suppose Wellington's point of view was that he hadn't been on active service for for several years. He had been in charge of recruitment. And basically, he... Uh, the active service he'd seen was in the colonial campaign, very unlike the peninsula, and only as a very junior officer. Um, so Wellington um, just tells him to go back to Lisbon and await his presence. Um, Wellington then um, manages to redeem his campaign um, and uh, arrives in great triumph in Li- Lisbon and <coughs> see, apparently sees Robinson, and he, he's turned around his opinion of Robinson. The only thing I can suggest is that uh, surrounding him were, were various generals, 
who had actually participated in the American War, were probably familiar with Robinson like that. Others may have known his skill at training recruits, which was absolutely uh, one of his great assets. Um, and also he had um, one of um, Wellington's chief staff officers will, was William Delancey, who was a fellow American loyalist, a very prominent loyalist family. And uh, I mentioned that before. And um, I suspect what happened was that they spoke in favour of Robinson and probably the what, Wellington was in winter quarters and had to reorganise his army. And the fact that somebody who was pretty good at training soldiers um, suddenly became an asset rather than a deficit. So he admired Wellington intensely um, be- because of his uh, superior abilities as a general, obviously, Um and uh, is is well, he's he's pretty uncritical of him. Although he does take up, as I say, these medical and uh, um, survival issues for on behalf of the soldiers, and doesn't get too strong a response from Wellington. So, once Napoleon abdicates for the first time, he ends up going back to America to fight in the latter stages of the War of eighteen twelve. What do we know about his thoughts and his service there? Was he conflicted about going back? Um, the eighteen twelve war has been. Um, is broken out in the meantime, uh, and um, basically he must have some anxiety for his relations in Canada, very close relations. Um, Wellington has this task as commander-in-chief of of sending brigades that have fought in the peninsula to um, Canada um, to to, uh, defend Canada against the infant United States. I mean, Robinson is obviously an obvious choice because he served with great distinction. He's much respected by the soldiers. He's pretty flexible. And he is an American, uh, at least in uh, in terms of his birthright. So he's an obvious choice that rather than going home, he suddenly finds himself shipped off to Canada as a, as, as, as a brigade commander. Um, so his feelings about this, I think he's more interested in seeing his family. He's, he's a deep loyalist, so... Um, he has a, I can, a split, a schizophrenic approach to Americans, but he, there's one little thing he says, um, the Battle of Plattsburgh, which is a British disaster, um, he's participatory in that, and again, he comes out of it pretty well, um, but he's, he attacks the British commander, uh, Prevost, um, for actually failing to bribe the Americans, because he says American, Americans are particularly susceptible to large bribes uh, for their intelligence to actually sort of um, turn double agents against their own side. So he, I, it would appear that he has not a particularly high view of Americans. Um, of course, then you get the Treaty Treaty. I mean, the 1812 war is a bit of a sort of gold of straw in some ways. It ends up with the same boundaries and all this kind of thing. But in a sense, it's a British victory because America's desire to take over Canada has been defeated. So the, the American war aim has not been fulfilled. Um, Robinson, being the senior officer on the spot, is appointed um, deputy governor, um, a, a lieutenant governor of uh, Upper Canada, the, uh, the, the, um, on, the place that became Ontario. Um, and he builds up the defences of that um, area. Um, of course, he gets a lot of ex-British soldiers, some of whom he's commanded to settle in the border areas. I remember years ago, um, I was invited to speak at the festival at Stratford, Ontario, the theatre festival. And I noticed when I went up to Stratford in southern Ontario, there's lots of villages with German names. And they're obviously where the Hessians of the mercenary Hessians of the British army had been settled at that time. So he builds up these defences against the Americans. Then he calls back, he's called back to... um, London, because the, the Prevo, who's um, the uh, lost the Battle of Plattsburgh, uh, I won't go into all the details, but he's he's requested a, cur- a court martial to protect his name, and Robinson is a key witness of this. So to get back to London, he has to travel back through the United States of America, so New York. So he visits uh, his old homestead on on the Hudson, and he meets his old slave nanny, and is rather touched by that. He travels on to New York, where he actually um, has re- still has relations. There are still relations. He's got a young cousin there that he stays with. And he, he goes and meets all the old families that he's known in when he lived in New York. 
And there appears to be no animosity uh, about the war whatsoever, either from him or from, uh, from, from the people that he meets. It seems to be um, settled down in, into a, a live and let live between the British and the Americans. The one thing that does astonish him, because he hasn't been in New York for 30 years, is the incredible change that's happened. New York has become as kind of individual difference, a sort of side from the colonial society that he's left. It's become a kind of vibrant, independent sort of society. So I think ultimately he he regarded himself in some sort of way as an American, um, but his loyalty, well, he was a loyal American, put it like that. That's the only description of him. And what about the later years of his life? Because he lives a long time. He lives as... Yes, he uh, lived into his, his 80s. Um, yeah, 1852 and, uh, he died, same year well, as Well, his, his uh, patron, Lord Hobart, is Secretary of War and the Colonies. And... Um, he's, he's become a colonial governor um, through almost by accident. Um, so the obvious thing for Hobart to do is to offer him another colonial government gov- governorship, because obviously he's going to become a half pay officer. Um, it's a complete disaster for him um, that he's sent off to, to govern Tobago, the West Indian island. We now know it as Trinidad and Tobago, but there are two different colonies in those days. Um, as I say, it's a complete disaster. Um, he goes there with his family. Uh, again, it's the the fever gets them. He loses his wife, his his son, and two of his daughters to fever. Um, and he uh, clashes with the settler population, the, the planters of, of Tobago. Um, he, uh, and this again slightly rebounds to his credit. He, he he attempt, the, there's a corrupt legal system that he attempts to sort out and therefore upsets the local lawyers. He appears to upset the local planters, not all of them, um, but, um, he, but by enforcing the British government um, laws against the slave trade. Um, by this time, of course, slavery with the slave trade in the British Empire has been made illegal. I don't think this is because he's... Um, a fervent abolitionist or otherwise, it's because he's the colonial governor and it's his task to enforce the slave trade doesn't, ex- doesn't exist anymore. So there's a great cabal of settlers who, uh, whose sole task is to get rid of him. In the past, they've had acting governors appointed from themselves. So his, uh, his time in Tobago is very unhappy. He does realise that one of the sources, he's back on his medical things again. He attempts, there's a vast swamp there that is the source of all this fever and disease and everything. And he, he sets out to try and get that drained. It, it eventually was, um, but he's recalled um, by Hobart to London. And basically then he finds himself as a sort of governor without a colony to govern. Um, and obviously uh, he's run into such trouble in Tobago that uh, Hobart is very reluctant to appoint him to another governorship, although he tries very hard. And he does his usual thing of writing to influential people, including the Duke of Wellington, who replies, I can do nothing for you. It's not, it's not within his remit, but he's commander in chief. Um, and so Robinson gets appointed to the colonelcy, which is a pretty honorary position, but it gives him the full whack of money of, of two... Uh, regiments in succession um, so that gives him uh, a, a nice comfortable existence so Wellington has helped him out to that level um, but he becomes completely inactive he retires to Brighton um, has a nice sort of social life I think where he's got, got a loving daughter who lives with him and looks after him and uh, and eventually he dies in 1852 as the longest serving soldier in the British army from the age of 14. Yeah, this is one thing about Wellington. He does try and do right by those who served with him. Uh, Nick, this has been a really interesting chat. I, I've loved it. Um, I've been filling in Alex on various little snippets of Peninsula War history as we've been going along behind the scenes as we manage the interview in the background. So thank you so much for your time. Wellington's American General is out now, folks. You can get it from the History Hack bookstore. Link's in the description. Please do make sure that you support the 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 show but also crucially nick and independent booksellers by buying it that way 
because you know my rant about Amazon and Jeff Bezos and rocket fuel and all the rest of it, I will now shut up because Alex has given me the eye. No, uh, it's fine. It's true. People. Don't give Jeff Bezos any more money. He's got enough. Give it to us instead and Nick. And well, I'm sure you have money. all the money, Alex. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nick has been great. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure to see you all. And best of luck. Cheers. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.